be carried about by students at the university to be laid aside when the work of life begins. But as the generations pass, travelers will hum them on the highway and men upon rivers. It reflects a benign sexism and one of Ireland's foremost poets. It simultaneously suggests the economic frailty of women in that time. How does Tagore's treatment of the female personality differ? Tagore viewed women as active within the shaping of culture. He wrote, if education is a tool for human development, and if education is birthright of a human being, I do not understand how we can deprive the women from education. Tagore's female characters tend to have a strong and active role, and they also remain earthy and human. And the gardener, he writes, for my heart comes out and dances the image of my own desire. Gleaming vision flits on. I try to clasp it firmly. It eludes me and leads me astray. I seek what I cannot get. I get what I do not seek. In this work, lustful feelings appear problematic and insulting without the accompanying sense of friendship. Friendship is highly honored in this work as an end itself, rather than a means to an end. Tagore is beautiful for his humanness and dedication to enriching the social lives and responsibilities of others. He frequently engaged with the most important intellectuals of his time, including Einstein. In conversation with Einstein, he says, the infinite personality of man comprehends the universe. There cannot be anything that cannot be subsumed by the human personality. And this proves that the truth of the universe is human truth. Here, he suggests that the human personality must be given free expression to seek and contemplate. This implies, in lieu of his statement about education of women, that the female personality also plays a pivotal role in shaping the human personality. Tagore says of love, Love adorns itself. It seeks to prove inward joy by beauty. Culture is an expression of joy, of love, of the living human. Cultural works are principles, agents, catalysts, and the modus operandi of the content of human nature. In his own words, Tagore believes, the human soul is on its journey from law to love, from discipline to liberation, from the moral plane to the spiritual. The differentiation of discipline and freedom, morality and spirituality, is like the letter of the law is distinct from the spirit. This journey that culture offers as an adventure is a quest of the finest sort of which the human higher human partakes in order to learn the truth of God. Such an adventure presents the creative act as exploration and perceives creativity and openness as the deepest resonances of the spirit. As the human form tasks itself in developing moral principles, it recognizes its own freedom. To this freedom is its rebellion and distinction. War remains the sage of Bengal culture because he artfully protests wrong-headedness. His views were ahead of the period they developed within, proving that the mind of the human race has exemplary force. In this forthright and stalwart form of mind, Tagore speaks bravely to an age far in advance of its development. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dustin. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Dustin. Yeah, Madhu, over to you. Over to you, over to you. Thank you. That was beautiful. You, in fact, touched upon every aspect of Rabindranath Tagore, the polymath. Thank you. I call upon the next speaker and I introduce her before I do so. Our next speaker would be Shomrita Urni Ganguly. Hi, Shomrita. Uh, she's a professor and an award winning poet. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. 
Madhu, please sorry, check. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Am I audible now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, please go back again. Thank you. Uh, next would be Shomrita Urni Ganguly. Uh, Shomrita Ganguly is a professor and an award-winning poet and literary translator. She was a Fulbright doctoral research fellow at Brown University and is an alumna of the University of East Anglia Interna International Literary Translation and Creative Writing Summer School. Uh, she is currently uh, the professor uh, at the, she is the head of the Department of English at Maharaja Manindra Chandra College, University of Calcutta, and has worked on literary translation projects, uh, literary translation projects, literary prize. She is a co-chair of the Global Council for Excellence for Environment and, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, she worked on the literary translation projects with Room to Read USA and the National Center for Writing UK. Her work has been so showcased at the London Book Fair and she has read in cities like Bloomington, Bombay, Boston, Calcutta, Cove and Delhi and many more. Uh, She's, uh, Shomrita edited the first anthology for food, uh, anthology of food poems, Kesidia and other adventures and translated three stories, Sharat Chandra Chattopadhyay in 2021, Fire Songs in 2019, Shokuni in 2019 and The Midnight Sun, Love Lyrics and Farewell Songs 2018 among other works. So over to you, Shomrita. Uh, she is going to speak on the on, on Tagore's letter and eco-criticism. Tagore's response to nature. All of us know that Tagore's connect with nature began very young in life. And his first poem was written uh, when he was about seven odd years old. Uh, just a couplet, Jol Pore Pata Nore Pagla Hati Matha Nare. Shomrita, over to you. Shomrita, please unmute yourself. We are eager to hear you. Namaskar. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. Arindam Madhu, thank you for that very warm introduction. For a moment, it wasn't about me. And I'm really excited to meet the person who it was about. So, um, so glad you brought up Quesadilla as well. Um, Rochelle is a part of the anthology. Benita's launched the anthology. Dustin's reviewed the anthology. So, you know, it's like a, it's like a coming together of sorts for us. Um, thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, when Orindam first told me about uh, this session, um, I wasn't sure if I would be able to make it and uh, primarily because, um, I mean, this, this is no news for anybody. Uh, things aren't very good in Calcutta right now. And for any of us uh, that's been protesting over the last week or so, um, it's very difficult to find yourself in a space where you can talk poetry, art, literature, you begin questioning. I, I begin questioning myself, my role, my contribution. What can I do differently? What can I do better? Um, and then I thought if I have to talk today, I will talk about something that I have been um, thinking about very, very passionately for a couple of years or more now. Um, what is my role in this society, but also what is my role in the society vis-a-vis my consumption of nature, my consumption of this earth, my consumption of where I now belong. Um, how do I connect this with the episode that has happened in Calcutta? Because uh, human beings in our attempt to develop, in our attempt to get to certain goals, in our attempt to get to certain places, 
uh, human beings have usurped uh, certain roles for themselves. And these roles mandate that human beings violate the body of the woman and they violate the skin that we walk on, which is earth. So the systemic violation of the woman's body, along with the violation of nature, helped me realize that it is, it is probably not enough to be a feminist only, that I need to think about feminism through the eco-critical lens, that I need to think about women in conjunction with nature, human life in conjunction with nature. Um, it was through that perspective that I re-entered uh, Tagore, went back to what I had read before, started looking at it through the eco-critical perspective. And so for today's discussion, I thought I will read a few letters uh, by Tagore, um, not very well anthologized, not often discussed, and try and highlight how somebody had this consciousness, not only in the early 19th century, that too, but also in his early 20s. Uh, so there is no excuse for us to say, oh, we are very young. There is no denying the reality of climate change that is staring at us in the face. Um, so we will start with basics. Um, because I know that this session is also recorded. All of us here are aware of this, but for a broader audience, what is eco-criticism? Um, simply put, it is the connection that we draw between literature and nature. However, that is the definition at a very simplistic level because there are arguments that would the romantic poets, capital R, the Wordsworths, Coleridge's, Keats, and Shelley's, and Byron's, would they then feature as eco-critical poets? I feel it is not only the writing per se, but the lens through which we are approaching this writing that makes the work eco-critical enough or eco enough. Um, so if eco-critical uh, readings are readings of literature, to find out the kinds of connections uh, uh, that can be established through this text, through this work of art, then what is ecofeminism? These are the lines that we draw, the parallels that we draw between the woman and her lived experience, the woman's body and the body of nature, the body of this earth the body of this planet. And therefore, as eco-critics, as eco-feminists, what we are trying to look at would be these capitalist patriarchal structures that are thereby going about dominating um, and destroying the body of the woman and the body of this earth. Uh, what does Tagore say about this? Uh, so what I've thought is we'll read a little bit, of, a little bit from a, re a letter go back to the theoretical discussion and so on and so forth. So I, I have made a list, I have an eye on the time and we might or might not read all the letters I've listed but we'll definitely read a few. This is, this is something that Tagore wrote um, when he was aged 25, I'm looking for the page number. So um, October 1885, so Tagore is just about 24, 25 at this point in time. He's describing nature. Um, I've skipped a few portions and I've come to this. The unsheltered sea heaves and heaves and blanches into foam. It sets me thinking of some tied up monster straining at its bonds in front of whose gaping jaws we build our homes on the shore and watch it lashing its tails. What immense strength with waves swelling like the muscles of a giant. From the beginning of creation, there has been this feud between land and water. The dry earth slowly and silently adding to its domain and spreading a broader and broader lap 
for its children, the ocean receding step by step, heaving and sobbing and beating its breast in despair. Remember, the sea was once sole monarch, utterly free. Land rose from its womb, usurped its throne, ever since the maddened old creature with hoary crest of foam wails and laments continually like King Lear exposed to the fury of the element. That a 24 year old person in the early 19th century, so this is when industrialization, the industrial revolution is at its peak, realizes that if the monsters from the forest have walked into our houses and are threatening us, it is not because we need to be protected, but it is because we have usurped the territory that once belonged to this monster. It is because we have built roads through these forests, through these jungles. It's because the land, as he says, has risen and pushed the sea the sea which used to surround us like a girdle, back and back and back until it receded to a point of no return. Which takes me back to something that uh, another favorite writer has said, Milan Kundera, um, Czech writer. And he says this in uh, The Unbearable Lightness of Being. And he says, the book of Genesis, the first book, um, the book of Genesis says that God has created man and given him dominion over fish and fowl. And then Milan Kundera questions, but who wrote the book of Genesis? Was it written by a horse? Was it written by a flower? Was it written by a tree? Was it written by a rohu fish? In which case, is it possible that God did not create man to give him dominion over fish and fowl, but that man created God to legitimize the power that he has usurped for himself over fish and fowl? The day we realize that we are not living on earth only, but that we are made of earth, that there is no distinction in every religious system for those of us, for those, for, for people that are religious, for people that are spiritual, um, or, or for, you know, the other half of the world, people like me that are probably not as religious, that are probably more prone to the sciences, um, that this body does not disappear, that this body did not come out of thin air. From dust we come and to dust we return. Whether you're burying the body or you're cremating the body or you're leaving the body out on the soil or you know, in, the, in these modern practices that we have where the body uh, decomposes and then a tree is planted and it grows into a tree. This body does not go anywhere. This body is made of the elements that constitute this planet. So the day we realize that when we are poisoning this soil, when we are poisoning this earth, we are also thereby poisoning ourselves because we are an extension of this planet, this earth. I think we would um, start taking this toxicity a little more seriously. Uh, moving on from here to the next letter. Uh, this comes a couple of years later. 1888, and Tagore writes, our houseboat is moored to a sand bank on the farther side of the river. A vast expanse of sand stretches away out of sight on every side, with here and there a streak as a water running across through sometimes what gleams like water is only sand. Not a village. 
not a human being, not a tree, not a blade of grass. The only breaks in the monotonous whiteness are gaping cracks, which in places show the layer of moist black clay underneath. Looking towards the east, there is the endless blue above, endless white beneath. Sky, empty. Earth, empty too. The emptiness below, hard and barren. The emptiness overhead, arched and ethereal. One could hardly find elsewhere such a picture of stark desolation. 1888 at the peak of the Industrial Revolution, when we, for the first time, start systematically dominating over elements of nature because man thinks that he has become the master of the machine through this revolution and that he has become the master of other men through his colonial expansions and that he has become the master of his own faith because Darwin, 1858, on the origin of species. So when man thinks he is the sole master, there is this prophet poet who is probably at around this time, he's probably between 27, 28 years old, who points out the starkness that is staring at us in the face. Um, I'll quickly move on to, and this is one of my favorite letters, where he talks about um, a band of gypsies. A little later in his life, I'll find out the page number from here. Okay. Mm. Almost there. Almost there. This is February. I'm trying to go to June 1891. So he's seen a band of gypsies and he's describing them. I will pick a section from here because this is long. And thank you for still being there with me. Yes. Nope, not really. I have found another one from June, but this is not the one that I want to read. So this is also about his consciousness of nature. Okay, let's take a look at this one and we'll find the gypsy letter in a bit. Um, from the bank to which the boat is tied, a kind of scent rises out of the grass and the heat of the ground given off in gasps actually touches my body. Yeah, let's look at that. The heat of the ground given off in gasps actually touches my body. He hears this world calling out to him, the world of nature. It's gasping for breath. And that breathlessness is something that this young man feels and comments on. I feel that the warm living earth is breathing upon me and that she also must feel my breath. Not far off, there is a ferry. A motley crowd has assembled under the banyan tree, awaiting the boat's return. And as soon as it arrives, people eagerly scramble in. I enjoy watching this for hours together. It is market day in the village on the other bank. That is why the ferry is so busy. Some carry bundles of hay, some baskets, some sacks. Some are going to the market, others coming from it. Thus, in this silent noonday, the stream of human activity slowly flows across the river between two villages. And I sat wondering, why is there always this deep shade of melancholy over the fields and the river banks, the sky and the sunshine of our country. And I came to this conclusion that it is because with us, nature is obviously the more important thing. The sky is free, 
the fields limitless, and the sun merges them into one blazing whole. In the midst of this, man seems so trivial. And I have found the other letter that I was referring to, I think. Yes, I have. Um, but in the midst of this, man seems so trivial. So going back to the idea that human life uh, compared to the infinite space that has been gifted to us, that we have been blessed with, is really small, really trivial, no matter how big our egos are, no matter how fat our poetry anthologies are, no matter how many people attend our um, you know, workshops. When you look at the bigger picture, this is how small we are. And despite being this small, we have the arrogance and the audacity to systematically destroy these elements around us. Uh, this will be the final one that I read because I have an eye on the time. I can share some others. I can share the dates and uh, we can take a look at them. Um, this is something he wrote in February 1891. Just in front of my window, on the other side of the stream, a band of gypsies have ensconced themselves, putting up bamboo frameworks covered over with split bamboo mats and pieces of cloth. That is always the gypsy's way. No home anywhere, no landlord to pay rent to, wandering about as it pleases them with their children, their pigs and a dog or two. And on them, the police keep a vigilant eye. I frequently watch the doings of the gypsy family nearest to me. They are dark, but good looking, with fine, strongly built bodies, like Northwest country folk, their women are handsome and have tall, slim, well-knit figures, and with their free and easy movements and unnatural, independent airs, they look to me like swarthy English women. These are truly the children of the soil, born on it somewhere, bred by the wayside, here, there, everywhere dying anywhere, night and day, under the open sky, in the open air, on the bare ground. They lead a unique kind of life, and yet work, love, children, and household duties, everything is there. So I will wrap up with this concept of the noble savage. This is not something that Tagore uh, talks about independently. Uh, the concept of the noble savage has also been touched on by William Wordsworth, um, by Rousseau in The Social Contract, where he says, man is born free, but everywhere he is in chains. And who is creating these chains for man but he himself? So who then is this noble savage um, that people like Wordsworth, that people like Tagore envisage somebody who is able to live in close communion with nature, somebody who is able to live in close harmony with nature. Savage, not in the sense of bestiality, but savage in the sense of somebody that is untamed, that is not domesticated, that is at home in nature. And then the nobility of the human soul shining through in that setup. Um, will we ever be able to get to that given where we have, um, people might call it progress, I call it regress, given where we have regressed in terms of our relationship with nature? I do not know, but one can hope. Um, there are two ways of looking at the cri climate crisis. Um, the first is fear, that you cannot deny that you have destroyed this planet in ways beyond repair. So hold on to what is left. But I try to look at the second way because fear is not something that makes me work very hard. 
its beauty, to look at the beauty that this world has offered to us. And if this is not something that we can protect, then, well, it's a shame. There is no reason for us to call ourselves the most evolved of creatures. Um, so I just wanted to take us back to the early 19th century, where in the Western world, the Industrial Revolution is at its peak. And um, in the Eastern world, um, you know, Orientalism is something that people just start talking about at around this period. In the Eastern world, there is this poet, not just a poet, but a prophet poet, who is trying to give an alternative view of how life can be lived in close communion with nature. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you to um, SLF and Different Roots for the festival and for giving me this space. I hope we keep talking a lot more about nature, definitely not in air conditioned chambers. I'm sweating. There are little changes that we can make in our own lives. Um, it might not be much, but it's better than nothing. So thank you so much. Thank you, Shomrita. Very well presented. Uh, I'll now call Modu. Please take over. Thank you. Thank you, Shomrita. That was fantastic, giving us an insight into Tagore's consciousness and awareness of environmental degradation perpetrated by humankind that early. Beautifully presented. Thank you. I now call upon our next guest of honor, uh, Dr. Anita Nahal. She is an Indian American author, academic. Anita has been nom nominated twice for the Pushcart Prize 2022 and in 2023, and was a finalist for the Tagore Literary Prize in 2023. Anita has four poetry collections, four books for children, one novel, and five edited poetry anthologies published. Anita's poems have been anthologized in over 20 international anthologies and hundreds have been published in journals in the US, Asia and Australia. Her third book of poetry, What is Wrong with Us Kali Woman, is prescribed as mandatory reading in Utrecht University in Netherlands. She teaches at the University of the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C. Welcome, Anita. Over to you. Thank you so much, Madhu. Thank you to Arindam um, for you know everything that he does, his myriad creative ventures, including the Shanti Niketan Literature Festival. Kudos to his team, Anumita Roy and Madhu Gangopadhyay. Before I begin, I want to congratulate both Dustin for his comments on Tagore's humanism and Sumitra's words about earth and conservation. After all, we refer to earth as mother earth, the only planet that we currently know as home. So we humans abuse women, each other, and our universal mother, our planet. So I have a lot of feelings brewing right now inside of me based on what has happened in Kolkata and what is, of course, happening around the world in terms of conflict and abuse generally, and also this festival, keeping this festival in mind. So please bear with me as I share these thoughts, and I know I have 10 minutes. I hope I can do it in some structured manner. First of all, for two reasons, the Shanti Niketan Festival holds intrinsic value for everyone. One is the location, and second is its contextualization therein. The location of the festival, uh, in, in, after its namesake in Shanti Niketan, which means peaceful abode, is located about 1995 miles from Kolkata and was developed by the Bindranath Tagore, Rabindranath Tagore's father. And second, the festival is held on the grounds of Vishwabharti University. The words imply the world connects and communes with India, a university which Rabindranath Tagore created in 1921 as Shanti Niketan. It's a beautiful idyllic location, which I've had the pleasure of savoring through pictures on the net. It's indeed a privilege to be one of the guests of honor for this first online poetry reading gathering. 
my respect for Rabindranath Tagore is deep seated, not only because he was a prolific and great poet and novelist, short story writer, lyricist, painter, but because I am a professional historian, besides being a full time writer. I teach history at a university. So I view him from the lens of the late 19th and early 20th century reform movements and the Bengal Renaissance. While the movement we know began in Bengal, it captured the imagination of people in other parts of India as well, such as of course in Maharashtra, in the Punjab with Arya Samaj. Rabindranath Tagore and his family were deeply seeped in educational reform and he also explicitly rejected the caste system and untouchability in his writings. I also perceived Tagore from the perspective of the resolute stand he took after the Jallianwala Bagh tragedy of 1919. In protest, he later returned the knighthood which King George V had awarded him in 1915. Some might point to the fact that despite belonging to an educated and progressive Bengali family of the time, he was married at the age of 22 to a 10 year old girl child. And his own daughters also, he got them married at the ages of 12 and 14. As historians, we accept those facts. And as historian analysts, we deduce that sometimes we can be influenced by the emotions and vicissitudes of our times. Tagore was indeed conflicted on this issue. And as Amiya Sen said in an article in 2019, rightly or wrongly, Tagore associated the practice of early marriage or betrothals with the institution of extended families. However, he also hoped that the gradual weakening of extended families would seriously discourage early marriages." Unquote. And in terms of the stands Tagore took, one of them indeed was women's education. In an article in the New York Times dated November 6, 1930, I'm just reading out the headline. Tagore asks chance for India's women, plans a university for them as key to country's future, calls schools defective, denounces educational system as alien to the life of people and designed for boys only. And so, as we know, his wish for Bharati University came a few years after that with a mission to provide education for everyone. And of course, as earlier mentioned, many of Tagore's novels had independent self-reliant women characters and his uh, view as a humanist uh, is is not comparable is uncomparable to few at that time. Uh, his inspiring words about Vishwa Bharati truly epitomizes his humanism. To quote, Vishwa Bharati represents India where she has her wealth of mind, which is for all. Vishwa Bharati acknowledges India's obligation to offer to others the hospitality of her best culture and India's right to accept from others their best. I often tell students in my classes and others who are younger, whom you want to mentor and provide you know, direction in the right path, take the best from any culture, yours or others, and ignore or you know overlook or just put aside or respond to and protest about those things that are negative. I myself grew up in a hybrid home, by the way, Punjabi, Hindi, Urdu. So an Indian linguistic amalgam was going on where Tagore was often spoken about. Of course, because whenever the national anthem was played, we were reminded of him. But also because for my parents, the first line of Tagore's verses from Gitanjali, verse 35, and I do have the English translation with me, that verse which we all are pretty familiar with, the first line is where the mind is without fear and the head is, is held high. This sentence was almost a second skin when my parents spoke about running for their lives while leaving their birth homes in old India converted to a new country, Pakistan, in 1947. My father wrote the novel Azadi in 1975 on the partition of India. 
So it was real for them and for millions on both sides of the border, crisscrossing the two countries, leaving behind all they had known for all they had hoped to know. Tagore is also personally relevant to me because I was a finalist uh, for the 2023 Rabindranath Tagore Literary Prize and to be associated with a polymath as Tagore in this prize was a huge honor for me. At this time, I would like to acknowledge that the online Shanti Niketan Literature Festival was delayed as a mark of respect to the young doctor who was recently raped and murdered in Kolkata. In India, people are awakened rudely from their sleep again and again and again by a nightmare that refuses to go away. Abuse of women, rape, murder. I hope that our online Zoom event honors Rabindranath Tagore's legacy and honors the struggle for many causes that Tagore led and wrote about in his writings. W.B. Yates, in his introduction to the English translation of Gitanjali, spoke of Tagore's writings as, to quote, the work of his supreme culture, unquote. I believe we are still to get there because as Abdul Ghaffar Khan said, if you wish to know how civilized a culture is, look at how they treat its women. Or as President Obama said, you can judge a nation and how successful it is based on how it treats its women and its girls. Or as Gandhi said, the true measure of any society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable members. I'm going to end for now because I believe there's a second round where we'll, we will read some poems and I will just read out a couple of lines from uh, uh, two short poems of mine. So I will end for now and hand over the mic to others. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anita, uh, for reiterating on the fact uh, that Rabindranath Tagore, despite being influenced by his time, was very progressive nonetheless. Thank you so much. Uh, I call upon our next guest of honor, Professor Neela Bhattacharya Saxena. Dr. Neela Bhattacharya Saxena is a professor of English and Women's and Gender Studies at Nassau Com Community College, New York. Her publications include Absent Mother God of the West, A Kali Lover's Journey into Christianity and Judaism, and In the Beginning is Desire, Tracing Kali's Footprints in Indian Literature. Uh, Dr. Neela Bhattacharya, over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> First of all, I am deeply grateful to Arindam, uh, my classmate from Allahabad University, and I also see another classmate here, Smita, for including me in this wonderful uh, gathering of people giving tribute to Tagore and also commenting on our current predicament. So I would like to give a short talk, which is called Decolonizing Reality with Tagore interdependence of beauty and truth in our consciousness. In a celebrated dialogue between Tagore and Einstein on July 14, 1930, Einstein posed a crucial problem, quote, whether truth is independent of our consciousness, unquote, and believed in the purely objective nature of reality. With an expansive understanding of human consciousness, Tagore replied, quote, what we call truth lies in the rational harmony between the subjective and objective aspects of reality, both of which belong to the superpersonal man." Unquote. In an astonishing turn of events, Tagore's poetic vision seems closer to the knowable reality, which is quixotic and more like consciousness as many scientists like Bernardo Kastrup, Donald Hoffman, and Federico Fagin are discovering. We may be on the cusp of a revolution where understanding of consciousness may become a scientific pursuit and we, and we will decolonize reality. In a world where external development has become the mantra of the day, 
the planet under the Anthropocene is in crisis. The transformation of consciousness with Rabindranath Tagore is worth considering. Religious perspectives affect how we see reality, nature, animals, vegetation, life, and death that Professor Ganguly already talked about. At the end of their dialogue, Einstein had quipped that he was more religious than Tagore. For Einstein, when it came to the truth, an objective reality independent of the observer was crucial. Perception of an objective reality replete with separate different things that stand alone and get randomly impacted like the billiard balls on a pool table has been a staple of scientific thinking that arose out of European enlightenment. It is not very different from a reality created by an external and exoteric deity who stands outside his created universe, observes it with delight or distaste, and sometimes destroys and starts again. Now, a hundred years after, quantum science is proposing a completely different perspective on reality. Anthony Sudby points out, quote, it is Tagore who attempts to support his position by rational argument, while Einstein simply states his position as a matter of faith, unquote, and shows that quantum mechanics is remarkably close to Tagore's view. Brian Greene, in 100 Years of Uncertainty, examines Einstein's lifelong discomfort with quantum uncertainties and asks, quote, can it really be that the solid world of existence and perception in which a single definite reality appears to unfold with dependable certainty rests on the shifting sands of quantum probabilities? Well, yes, probably. The evidence is compelling and tangible, unquote. Deeply steeped in the Indic gynocentric milieu that I call the mother principle, Tagore was quite at home in the quixotic nature of reality. He was not invested in the pursuit of an androcentric certainty, but in the dance with Prakriti, the feminine principle, where truth and beauty are one. Aesthetics in its original sense, after all, is about our sensate life, our existence here and now. But poets have always been more at home with the feminine, no matter what their cultural conditioning may be. John Keats could effortlessly dissolve with his nightingale into a tender night and bathe in his negative capability. This is a world that is comfortable in the profound darkness of the night sky, the emptiness of the womb of Indic tradition, the void of Kali and Tara. Here light itself is a beautiful but fragile child born out of a profound creative nothingness. Tagore's sense of beauty was not just about the creation of beautiful objects, but it spanned a whole range of human creativity. Tagore's vision was about sculpting our life to suffuse it not only with supreme beauty, but with an ethics of living harmoniously with the world. Here beauty and truth dance together, and Tagore's extensive work attests to that idea. Unfortunately, we have split Prakriti and Purusha. We have created a split world. And without realizing the Purusha is not the male of the species, but the one that is aware of oneself. Actually, since <laughs> we uh, have been talking about what is going on in Kolkata, I began writing my blog, uh, which is called Stand Under the Mother Principle, after that horrifying rape and murder of this young woman in Delhi. And how sad that today we have repeated. This is nothing new. And I began writing and I called No, no Country for, uh, for Women because I invoked other traditions within India where this completely different understanding of the dance of the two, the realizer and the realizer, Prakriti and the Purusha, Shiva, Shakti, Yin, Yang. We have so many different ways of understanding it. And I find the same thing in many other traditions. Right now I am, you know, as, as you mentioned my last book, Absent Mother God of the West, I went deeper into Christianity and Judaism. And I find the same, same dance. Uh, the Gnostic tradition, the Kabbalah of Judaism, everywhere that this beautiful dance. And since uh, this um, going beyond nationalism, Dustin Pickering talked about going beyond nationalism, an understanding of our uh, collective fate today under the Anthropocene. Uh, obviously, for some misguided reasons, we thought we are separate from property. We thought that we can dominate. And the results are, of course, uh, very clear today. 
So I hope that we can all today, whether east, west, north, south, wherever we are, whoever we are, whatever gendered capacity, we can no longer create a split world. We cannot create a battle of the sexes. We cannot create a dominating uh, universe because that's self-destructive. We will end up destroying ourselves if we more and more create these borders. And incidentally, since you, uh, one of you also talked about the borders, right? We talked about partition. Uh, Dr. Nahal talked about partition. I am also a child of that. My uh, mother's family had to flee what is now Bangladesh. And my very first published piece was called Border in the Courtyard, a Partition India and My the Mother's Home. So this creation of constant separation, constant of not just separation, but a kind of battling situation has brought us to this, uh, you know, absolutely critical uh, situation. And yes, absolutely, the eco-criticism points out that how we have conflated the body of the woman with nature, with all that. And, and because we have, we have thought, we, for some strange reason, we thought we were pure wine, you know, Cartesian split and all the things that uh, I have written <laughs> uh, pretty much, uh, non, you know, quite a lot. But so I am again, extremely, extremely grateful to different truths to Arindam and all of you here for this great privilege to participate in this gathering. And later I will uh, share some of my own uh, small forays into the world of poetry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nila. Very nice having you with us. And Smita is also here. So thank you. And Madhu, please take over. Thank you. Thank you so much. I must say that this session is turning out to be very enriching and informative too. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Neela Bhattacharya Saxena, for uh, telling us how Tagore be believed in transformation of consciousness and his that he was a humanist and a rationalist who believed in the oneness of intellect and truth. Thank you. Now I call upon our next guest of honor, Vinita Agarwal. Vinita Agarwal's latest collection of poems, Twilight Language, won the Proverse Prize Hong Kong 2021. She has authored five books of poetry. She was awarded the Ravindra Tagore Literary Prize in 2018 and the Gayatri Gamash Memorial Award for Literary Excellence USA in 2015, and a special mention in the Hawkers Prize in 2019. Her work was shortlisted for the inaugural Dipankar Khivani Memorial Prize 2021. She co-edits the Your Book series of Indian poetry in English. She has edited two anthologies on climate change, open your eyes that was in 2020 and count every breath in 2023 she is based in indore and her work has been widely published and anthologized she is on the advisory bo board of the tagore literary prize she is a she co-chaired for the global council for excellence for environment and sustainability she was one of the 20 poets to be featured in a documentary on Asian poets titled Deepest Uprising Made in Taiwan. Welcome, Vinita Agarwal. Over to you. Vinita Agarwal would be giving us an insight into the Museum of Tagore in Kalimpong, Ravindra Museum in Kalimpong. Thank you, Madhu. A very good evening, everyone. Thank you, Arindam, for this very kind invitation to be a part of the Shantiniketan Literary Fest. It's always a pleasure to be associated with anything to do with Rabindranath Tagore. And I've touched upon, I've chosen this topic today because I have uh, childhood memories of this place. Many moons ago, when I was in class four and five, I studied in Kalimpong in the St. Joseph's Convent. And then later, it was too early at that time to realize that Rabindranath Museum exists in Kalimpong. But later I came to know. And then it, it 
kind of occupied a soft space in my heart to think about my childhood. You know, I'm very attached to this old Darjeeling district and Kalimpong. And it was very, very heartening to know that uh, Rabindranath Tagore had a summer home there. And not many people know about this. And I thought I'd like to touch upon it because it had this personal connect with me and also because it's very interesting. And I'm going to share more with you on this. So the Rabindra Museum is a museum located in Mangpu near Kalimpong in the state of West Bengal, India. Poet Rabindranath Tagore stayed in this house in 1938 and 1939 at the invitation of poet and novelist Moitroi Devi, the wife of quinologist Dr. M. M. Sen. Quinologist being somebody who studies quinine, which is used to treat malaria. And even now, but at that time in particular, malaria was a very big malaise in society. And so a lot of research went on in those areas because the Sincona bark was used for research. And Kalimpong is very famous for its Sincona plantations. So this little known Himalayan village was a much loved summer retreat of Rabindranath Tagore. Falling in love with the calm beauty of this Himalayan hamlet, Tagore spent many of his last years at Mongpu. He wrote his famous poem, John Mudin, at this scenic village. A tranquil little village in the mountainous Kershiong subdivision of North Bengal, Mongpu was a much-loved summer retreat of the Nobel laureate Rabindranath Tagore. Moitrei Devi was herself a renowned poet and novelist who wrote the famous Bengali novel Na Honyate. She also recorded the poet's stay with her in her delightful book Mongpute Rabindranath, the English translation of which is called Tagore by the Fireside. The house where Tagore stayed overlooked sprawling Sincona plantations and a quinine factory. The bungalow had been allotted to Moitrei Devi's husband, Dr. Manmohan Sen, who was the director of the quinine factory at that time. Delighted by the presence of the revered poet in their village, the locals of Mongpu celebrated Tagore's 80th birthday with great enthusiasm. On Moitrei Devi's insistence, Tagore even wrote a new poem, the legendary John Mudin. The poet recited this poem over the telephone from Kalimpong to All India Radio Calcutta, where it was broadcast live all over India. Some of the evocative lines from this beautiful poem, I quote, in the dusk of this life, let me fill from the well of beauty and refresh for one last time, my heart, body and soul let me cast away all striving, all argument, all suspicion, all fame, all blind ambition. There is an interesting anecdote about this historic broadcast. Mr. Lionel Fielding was the director of All India Radio's Calcutta station at that time. And he wanted to broadcast Tagore's poems recited by the poet himself live from Kalimpong. With this in mind, he visited Mongpu several times to meet Tagore and organize the broadcast, but the poet refused to meet Fielding. Fielding finally related his predicament to Dr. Sen, who promised to arrange an appointment for him. Sen then went and asked the poet about, about his refusal to give Fielding an appointment. I don't like them. They play the harmonium. Now it comes as a surprise to all of us that the harmonium is actually considered a very non-Indian uh, musical instrument. It was considered a Western, uh, a Western musical instrument. So Tagore says, I don't like them. They play the harmonium. The poet did not like this particular instrument as it could not reproduce the meat, an essential part of Indian music. So the microtones could not be reproduced by the harmonium. And it's so ironic now we listen and play the Robins Roshongit using the harmonium so eloquently. <laughs> Dr. Sen conveyed the poet's feelings to Fielding. Is that the only problem? Mr. Fielding asked. Yes, Dr. Sen replied. 
in that case, as of today, I am banning the harmonium on All India Radio, was Fielding's reply. And the harmonium stayed banned on All India Radio for many, many, many years. It was only revoked, uh, I think, somewhere in the 1970s when once again the harmonium began to be played on the on All India Radio. That was the kind of cloud that Tagore exerted. From that day on, the harmonium remained banned from the studios of All India Radio till the mid-1970s. The ban was lifted only after a lot of pressure was exerted on the management of Akashwani by the Harmonium Manufacturers Association to reintroduce the instrument. On his last visit to Mongpu in 1940, Tagore fell seriously ill and had to be shifted to Kolkata. He passed away the next year in 1941, leaving behind several of his possessions at the Mongpu residence. Later on, the bungalow was converted into a museum by the government and named Rabindra Bhavan. The museum displays several priceless memoirs, such as Tagore's original artworks, his handwritten documents, old photographs, and much more. Interestingly, the museum also had furniture that was designed by Tagore and carved by his son, Rathindranath Tagore. The museum caretaker can be found chanting the poet's compositions all day long as he takes visitors around the creaky old house. The bed in which Tagore slept is still there and has an inclined headdress that was specially made to help with his respiratory problem. His mahogany writing desk and chair face a window that has a gorgeous view of the lush green mountainside. It is easy to imagine the soothing effect of such tranquility on the nature-loving poet's imagination. And the latest on this Rabindra Museum is that in 2011, it was slightly damaged because of a storm and a huge tree fell on it. But since then it has been repaired and is open to the people again. So I wanted to share this uh, slice of life from uh, Tagore's uh, you know, days, his, his uh, days towards the end of his life. And uh, because I think this is, most of the festival was held in Shantiniketan. And it's so apt that we know about this Rabindra Museum also, which is in Kalimpong. And also it's very, um, what word should I use? Not only is it disturbing, but it is also in a way very appropriate that we talk about whatever is happening in Kolkata at present. And uh, somehow some of the panelists have also managed to integrate a little on uh, climate change and environment and ecology through Tagore's nature writing. And he was certainly a very, very a naturalist for sure. Tagore was definitely that. And just like to thank all of you, keep my presentation brief and not take up too much of your time. Thank you very much, all of you for being here. And I know so many of you, I've met so many of you. It's very nice to see you on the panel today. Thank you, Arindam. Thank you, SLF, so much. Thank you, Mathu. Thank you, Vinita. An excellent presentation. Uh, something which many of us don't know here. Yeah. Once again. And Madhu, thank over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Vinita. It was all, almost a vicarious kind of an experience, <laughs> very visceral. You taking us through the Ravindra Museum. Yeah. Very, very, uh, you know, we, we were transported to that museum for a while as you uh, spoke about his last days and all that he did there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I would now like to call upon our next guest of honor, Rochelle Portkar. Wildly anthologized, Rochelle is a prize-winning poet, author, and screenwriter based in Mumbai. She is the author of Four Degrees of Separation Poetry, Paper Asylum, which is a collection of Hybel, shortlisted for the Rabindra Tagore Rabindranath Tagore Literary Prize 2020 and Bombay Hangover's Short Fiction. An alumna of Iowa International Writing Program, which she did in 2015, and a Charles Wallace Writers Fellow, University of Stirling, 
2017 her poetry film poetry film skirt featured on shonda rhimes shondaland via the visible poetry project uh, as a creative writing mentor she conducts online poetry workshops for the himalayan writing retreat and was invited four times over to iowa international writing programs summer institute 2019 and between the lines from 2022 to 2024 as a creative writing faculty her prize winning manuscript of poetry coins in rivers was released this april 2024 by hatit india rashil will be talking of talking about rabindranath tagore and today through three of his poems over to you rashil thank you madhu and uh, thank you uh, arindam and uh, the entire team for inviting me and to all my fellow poets and thinkers and writers here uh, because uh, once we get immersed in a session then uh, you know i think we just we just gallop over over mindscapes and landscapes so uh, whenever there are tragedies around us especially to do with women and violence i go back to the past to see what have we not known about women that we treat them this way uh, it so happens that uh, i'm talking at this fest at this festival and i'm talking through tagore's lens but even otherwise i would have wondered what did the world not know about women to treat them and mistreat them to this levels of uh, mutilation violation assault and murder uh, I'm going to look at uh, three stories because uh, I was trying to search for answers through Tagore, and I'm, I'm so thankful to this festival for pointing me in that direction in my searching. And I would just touch briefly on the three uh, three stories and three poems. So the first one is uh, is called, and I might not pronounce it right, but uh, but it's the wife's letter or Srir Srir Patra. i hope i pronounced that right and it's the revolutionary tale of a woman who writes a letter to her husband asserting her independence and rejecting the traditional roles of household in this treatise amrinal the protagonist comes across as one of the strongest female character in bengali literature at that time and her letter reveals things about herself and how discerning she is what is interesting is of course i read the letter in english translation but i and i have few few snippets of that letter but what's interesting is she is supposedly a simple householder and yet she's so discerning almost as if she can view the world through the kitchen sink through her kitchen window and you get a view of the world looking through her window at at her and through her kitchen at the world these are the three uh, paragraphs only from the big letter uh, where she says i am mejobau the second bride in your joint family today 15 years later standing at the edge of the ocean i understand that i also have other relationships with the world and the world keeper so i find the courage to write this letter this is not a letter from your family's major bow not from the second one and a little before this she she writes a paragraph saying you have heard many things from me this is addressed to her husband and so have i from you but we haven't had the space enough to write a letter and i find this very beautiful because that's what happens in relationships we speak a lot spoken word but we don't have the space for other unsaid thoughts undercurrents and we think we've said it all and we are all aligned but we are not there are so many spaces that are required to be captured in relationships and tagore understood relationships so beautifully this is the second paragraph where she says your mother wanted desperately to make up for the plain appearance of the first bride with the good looks of the second that is herself otherwise why would you have taken all the time and trouble to travel to our distant village in bengal no one has to search for jaundice dysentery or a bride they come and cleave to you on their own and never want to leave 
Another paragraph says, the wedding flutes wailed, settling the skies to moan. I came to live in your house. At great length, the women tabulated all my shortcomings, but allowed that, by and large, that I might be reckoned a beauty. And when my sister-in-law, my Didi, heard this, her face grew solemn. But I wonder what the need was for beauty. Your family didn't love me for it. Had my beauty been molded by some ancient sage from holy Ganga clay, then it might have been loved. But the creator had molded it only for his own pleasure. And so it had no value in your pious family. I know uh, the rest of the letter is also as simple, but so discerning of what a housewife sees, which is very interesting to me because a housewife has always been invisibilized in society. And she is the fulcrum and the crux of civilization, not only because she rocks the cradle and rules the world, because she shapes so many things. So to look from Renal's point of view of how she understands so much about relationships and, ha and also the virtue or vice of what she considers beauty based on what society considers beauty, because this is a definition we are constantly up against of what is beauty and ugliness in today's society and why are women objectified to that levels that they are commodities, objects to be picked, to be used, to be consumed. We are still within the frameworks of what is beauty, what is property. Uh, the next story, because I'm, I'm aware of time, uh, I would have deliberated a lot more, but uh, the second story is uh, such a deceptive story called Mashi, the aunt. This story is about uh, an aunt, Mashi, who uh, is Jotin's, uh, who's, uh, who's Jotin's aunt, who's ailing. Now, while Jotin's wife, Mani, uh, is also around but she wants to go to uh, go to uh, to celebrate uh, a birth in her family uh, she doesn't take care of him at that moment and it's mashi who comes in to cover up cover up for mani and understanding the situation she uh, lies to uh, jotin that uh, no no mani is uh, is very concerned about you she does come to uh, come to look for you or look after you when you are asleep but uh, she, but i'm there and ma she takes uh, take takes care of jotin even if jotin tells her that uh, when i die uh, mani is going to inherit uh, all my property ma she takes good care of jotin and here we see uh, the selflessness of uh, of uh, the most uh, you know invisible woman because when a woman loves deeply and she's at home she's almost invisible when you realize that she she was there is when she's not there so uh, it's so interesting to see uh, how tagore could uh, could pick these nuances because in today's day and world of drama, melodrama, heightened reality, we are looking for huge explosive drama. Being a screenwriter myself, uh, I watch a lot of cinema as I think about a lot of uh, writing and creating stories. And you see the drama at a very heightened level. But the drama is in the inner drama and the simplicities of the four walls of the household that Tagore so beautifully could excavate and etch. So this story of, of love and kindness, uh, which is never to be assumed as a, a dramaticness. And then laboratory, the, the story of uh, how a man is uh, so fixated and so immersed in the themes of science and experimentation and human condition. He's in his pursuit of knowledge that he forgets about his wife and as a scientist and he forgets about his children. And uh, once he's dead, it is his uh, his uh, his wife who decides to defy societal expectations and dedicates her life to the scientific research to to take care of her husband's papers and his study and uh, also the undercurrents between relationships and children and uh, through each of these stories uh, there is so much of strength that comes through uh, through the women who are being portrayed whether they are uh, bright, new brides or whether they are old aunties. Uh, the poems that I would just briefly mention uh, that I thought were so resonant even today, and that's the reason my question is, what did we not know or what do, do we not know that Tagore has already told us about 
that we need to reinvent ourselves again and again as humanity and our huma humanness. What do we not know? Because we know everything. Tagore has told us everything. Like Ekla Chalore, what a beautiful poem on courage and determination where he urges individuals to walk alone and persist in your path even when no one supports you. How individualistic, how empowering, how beautiful because so many times we feel alone in a crowd and there is this anthem of Ekla Chalore. So it means trust yourself and move ahead. Today we move ahead as society trying to push back violence, trying to push back darkness but even even in all that, there is oneness and the oneness could be a collective oneness or it's an individual oneness. The other poem is uh, Nir, Nirjorer Swapnavanga, I hope I pronounced that properly, uh, which is translated as the fountain awakened from its dream. And in this poem, Tagore talks, talks about the fountain bursting into life after a long slumber. How philosophical, how beautiful that he when he talks about society, he talks about country, he talks about households, but he never forgets the individual that makes up the society. There's as much power in the one as is in the many. And this is the beauty of the, the micro uh, uh, analysis or the micro gaze of Tagore as he looks at the macro. The last poem being that I'm going to cover is the, the Bharato Bhagyo Vidata. And this beautiful poem that talks about India's destiny, recognizing the spirit that unites diverse people. And I think with that, Tagore captured the entire canvas of human existence. So there is nothing that we don't know. His writings, his deliberations, his ruminations were like a manifesto. So it is surprising that su such a big manifesto that we already have within our psyche we have within our uncollective within our collective unconscious within our personal unconscious how can we go so wrong as a society when we attack and assault women children minorities marginalized so that is my question and i happen to leave us and myself with that question thank you thank you rochelle Excellent elucidation. Uh, Madhu, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Rochelle, uh, for talking about Tagore's insight into the women's psyche and how he could understand their inner turmoil. He was really omniscient. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I call upon the last guest of honor for today. Aarti Janki. Aarti Janki is a Caribbean-born author of Indian ancestry, now settled in the USA. She began her writing career in journalism and is a 1985 graduate of IIMC, Indian Institute of Mass Communication, New Delhi. She emerged Poet of the Year in 2023 in Destiny Poet Poets of Wakefield, UK, and has been the chief, chief critic every month for the past two years with numerous highly commendable pieces of poetry. She also edited, the com edited and compiled an anthology titled Write. Book by Arti Janki include Heart Strings, The Legacy, Witty and Wise, Path of Peace, Hush, don't cry. In the footsteps of Rama, Lilavati and other stories, and East of the West, a journey. Aarti would be talking about the legacy of Tagore with emphasis on Gitanjali. Welcome, Aarti. Over to you. Hi, Aarti. Aarti, can you hear us? Please unmute yourself. Aarti is here. Hello, Aarti. Can you hear us? Oh, okay. Uh, yes, I got un unmuted yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, come, come. Please come. 
Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for giving me the privilege of being a guest of honor in this year's prestigious Shanti Niketan Literature Festival. I hope to stand out among the intellectuals. Oh, Arti, just a minute. Just a minute, Arti. Yeah. Can, can, you, can you kind of uh, put on your video, please? Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you for giving me the privilege of being a guest of honor in this year's prestigious Shanti Niketan Literature Festival. I hope to stand out among the intellectual readings today for the simplicity which Gurudev has said is not easy. The name Shanti Niketan resonates deeply with me, being the birthplace of Nobel laureate Gurudev Rabindranath Tagore. Today, I will tell you the story of my people and the role Tagore's writings played in their lives. I was born in Trinidad, an island in the Caribbean. Shortly after independence in 1962, the Indian government began its diplomatic and cultural relations in Trinidad and Tobago, a twin island state. Abhi Bhattacharya was a young man from Kashmir who was persuaded to make this island his home at the end of his term. A businessman of Indian origin constructed a secondary school with a house and a temple for him. Spread across the edge of a sugarcane plantation in Princess Town, not far from where I lived, Tagore Centenary College was established. An elder brother was among the first students to attend this school and brought home the first piece of Tagore. Where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls, where words come from the depths of truth, where tireless striving stretches its arms towards perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert, sands of dead habits, where the mind is led forward by thee into ever-widening thoughts and action, into that heaven of freedom, my father let my country awake. Line by line, I savored the words that seemed to scrub the world clean. It became the prayer most used to start programs such as this one we are attending today. It was also the morning prayer at the college. In 1995, the late Vasudev Pandey, the first prime minister of Indian descent in Trinidad, made this a national prayer. It added to the older generation's poetic rendition of Goswami Tulsi Das's Ram Charitramanas, the Gita and other Hindu literature learned by heart and brought in the enduring oral traditions of India to the overseas European plantations, Trinidad included. When it was my turn to attend college, the name had changed to Tago High School. In neighboring San Fernando, Gandhi Tago Ashram had become more of a gurukul than just a school. Starved as the islanders of Indian origin were for anything Indian, the schools were held in high esteem. The story of how Trinidad became home to thousands of India-born men and women began in 1838, following the freedom of slaves in plantations owned by colonial governments. Tricked into leaving India, they were fooled into believing that they would, they would get work across the river, earn handsomely to return home within a few days. Unable to read or write in, in the English language, they put their thumb prints on paper unknowingly to become indentured laborers, bonded for five years, 
after a torturous three months at sea, packed like sardines as they had been. The hardship at sea, sorry, sorry, the hardship at sea created a bond among the survivors, making them Jahajibai in a brotherhood of the ship. They managed to stay whole by retaining their Indian Indianness or way of life with inno innovations along the way. Slowly, the enslavement ended, and once freed from the brutality and oppression of the colonial system, they began to build homes for themselves. Villages were established and generations followed. My grandfather came from ja Jawanpur in Uttar Pradesh. My great maternal grandfather was born in Punjab. They were among those who fought and won rights to take their place side by side on the island that boasts a rainbow culture. Indian Heritage Month is now observed in the month of May each year, and on the 30th of May, the nation celebrates Indian Arrival Day as a public holiday. Rabindranath Tagore was perhaps the first Indian writer whose writings were translated into English and made available in Trinidad. Like many, while many converse in the mother tongue, it was Bhojpuri that became prevalent in the English-speaking nation. Most of those who read the scriptures were self-taught, while others learned from oral recitation. Tagore helped to shape the new identity from illiteracy to advanced learning. Now an oil-rich nation, the Indians laid emphasis on sending their children for higher education. Doctors, lawyers, and other professionals marked the rise in the fortunes of the Indo-Trinidadians. Oil wealth triggered down, and soon the journey to India to search for roots became common. In this dawn of literacy, the teachings of Tagore thrived. Hindi was taught in schools and other works of Tagore were acquired. My recent published book titled Heartstrings the Legacy begins with a quotation from Tagore that says, the one who plants trees, knowing that he will never sit in their shade, has at least started to understand the meaning of life. He wrote, let me not beg to be sheltered from dangers, but to feel but to be fearless in facing them, words that help to build fortitude. It is very simple to be happy, but it is difficult to be sim simple, an eye-opener, the same as fate is a bird that feels the light and sings when the dawn is still dark. His words shone the light of knowledge and made us wonder how he managed to keep such clarity purity and wisdom in his poems at a time when history was perhaps at one of its most darkest times. And though I have confined myself to his poetry, the fullness of his devotion to literature in general has not escaped me. Literature enabled inclusivity in society. At a recent book launch, it was noted that as Indians living in Trinidad, we often had to leave our Indianness behind to enter the outside world. It is the writings in books written in the same language and design like most of the rest of the world that help in breaking the barriers between the home and outer society. To write, one needs to keep the finger on the pulse of the people to extract the essence of the emotion experience. Only then, what is written can, test, can stand the test of time. The full volume of Tagore's words are staggering, even in today's world filled with technology to help us read and understand. Poems, plays, short stories, songs, and paintings, each one par excellence. It was more than enough to enhance the identity of not just Indians at home and abroad, 
but to the whole of humanity. Gitanjali has been my focus today, and it has also been the gift I have received over 300 times. And each time I have I presented it to precious friends who welcomed this gift with the same enthusiasm and adoration. In my part of the world, Tagore's literature has certainly gone a long way in influencing another Nobel laureate, Sir Vidya Naipaul, while most of us take inspiration not just to write, but to live meaningful lives, to give voice to stories that abound and poetry that enhances the art of writing. Finally, India's national anthem, Jana Gana Mana, must be mentioned for all its encompassing holistic qualities taken from a song written in 1905 by Tagore. I thank different fruits for placing the limelight on Rabindranath Tagore. It seems to me that more focus is paid on literature outside of India, when words that carry the most impact is overlooked. Take, for example, the popularity of Shakespeare when compared to Goswami Tulsidas, who were both writing at the same time. Tulsi Ramayan is a world classic in Hindi, yet outside of religious literature, the epic poem of Tulsidas is underplayed. So too, the poetry coming from the land of Tago misses the pulse beat of the master himself. Thank you once again for this opportunity to speak before such a wide, knowledgeable virtual audience. Tanyabad. Thank you, Arti. Uh, we'll have to hurry up in the next session. We have taken more time, all of us. So please keep your poem not more than a minute, a minute and a half, uh, but not more than two minutes at all. Modu, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Arti. Uh, thank you. Uh, it was incredible, you know, 300 book copies of Gitanjali. That is what caught my attention. And you gifting yes. them. So you're passing on Ravindranath's legacy. Thank you. Absolutely. It's always at the bedside. <laughs> we move on to the next round, which is poetry reading. And we start with Shomrita's Your Old Curio Shop is the title of her poem. We start with her. Shomrita, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Madhu. Um, this one's called Your Old Curio Shop. It's after Tagore's uh, work, Ghori Bairi, um, Home in the World. Your Old Curio Shop. I know a thing or two about home. Home leaving felt safer than homecoming on most nights. You were an empty city when I first arrived at your doors. The ghosts of your empty memories had taken the last empty train to go back to their empty nowheres. Do not touch, read the label. Look at his pride from light years away. But I don't take instructions too well. Always flying, dangerously close to the sun, stealing fire from the stars. You invited me into your old curio shop tucked away in the bylanes of your heart. I walked from shelf to shelf, to skin, to bone, to flesh, to breath, stumbled, tripped, danced. Your walls echoed my song. You will burn, you will burn, read the statutory sign. But how do you stop lovesick coils from singing in the rain? or building safe nests in old curio shops. Thank you so much. Fabulous poem. Thank you, Shomrita. Modu? I, I call upon... Modu, uh, you, please unmute yourself. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, I call upon our next guest of honor to recite her poem, Rape from her book, What's Wrong With Us, Kali Woman, Anita Nahal. 
Hi, everyone. So I, I'm going to take the liberty, if you don't mind. I'm only going to read one stanza or, or literally a few lines from this poem, and then another five line short poem, which was based on one of the Gore's poem. So rape is from this book, What's Wrong With Us, Kali Women? And I write primarily prose poetry, and which is very akin to um, spoken word. So this is from the middle of that poem. Nirbhaya Unayo Kathua Shakti Mills Hataraz Balrampur Hyderabad and I can add Kolkata now. Remember, remember the names, thousand more countless, faceless. If you don't remember the names, remember a woman's body, a young girl's body, a female child's body raped and dumped like it was not life. They say they are deprived, the ones that commit the crime. They say they aren't reared well, the ones that commit the crime. Products of crowded homes, poor homes, no sex education, mystification of a woman's body in Bollywood movies, excuses, excuses, excuses. And the second one is based on Tagore's poem, Stray Birds, which he wrote in 1921. Uh, there is this verse in that, verse 237. The actual verse was, The raindrops whispered to the jasmine, Keep me in your heart forever. The jasmine sighed, alas, and dropped to the ground. So my six-line poem picks up from there. It's a collection of six monocues. Monocues are haikus, but written in like, it's like a haiku written in one line in 17 syllables. My poem is called Mom and Her Motia, which is Jasmine. So the last line of Tagore's poem was, and dropped to the ground, and my mom picked you up, placed you on her pillow, inhaled your aura. Tagore's raindrop smiled, sighed again, whispered, you are with a special soul. Then they tiptoed away, hopscotching, cotling like sat satisfied children. Shaking water off, mom made you her earrings. Motia aglow, heart soothed. Don't often find you in America. Adorning mom in heaven? Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Lovely poem. Madhu? Uh, I would now uh, like to call upon our chief guest for this evening, Dustin Pickering, to recite his poem. Dustin, please, over to you. Uh, this is called Roseate Bloom. It kind of combines ecology with metaphysics. The evening swells into a harbor of benevolent care, caressed by lights from your fingers. These gates gladly accept your oaths. Heaven's door widely exclaimed the meager form, shadowy slumber. Roseate bloom forecasts in higher trembling, blush of the ancients, and cracks the gods' doubt. Youth will benefit from the winter rose, its deadened root blacker than tar, old dreams of dying at stairs weep. Thank you. Thank you, Dustin. Madhu? That was beautiful. Uh, so was your Miss Anita Nahal. Yours was also very, very beautifully evoked. We go on to our next recitation. Now, Neela, uh, Dr. Neela will present uh, something very unique for us. It's not a poem. Uh, and let us see what she has to offer us. Over to you, Dr. Neela Bhattacharya. Thank you so much. So first of all, I have to share my screen because I write what in Bangla we will call Chobita, Chavita in Hindi and two poems. 
this has started to come spontaneously and I want to dedicate. So let me first share my screen. You can share uh, the screen from uh, beneath. Uh, can you see that? You know, yes, yes, participant? yes. If you can click that. Yes, yes. So let me just make sure I have this and uh, bear with me. Okay, so here we go. <clears throat> can you see that? Lovely. Okay. Uh, all right. So, well, I'm calling it Ohe Shundaro Mori Mori. This is one of Tagore's uh, songs. Um, and it's a tribute to Kobi Guru. Uh, but I dedicate this to the memory of our Manasta, Dr. Manas Mukuldas, our teacher in Allahabad University, English department who recently passed away. Now, these lines I picked up when I was uh, in Shantiniketan, where Tagore talks about we have an insane person inside us and that gives form to stuff. So for some reason, there is a book called Alphabet versus the Goddess, a conflict between word and image. And somehow I thought in our tradition, that does not happen. So here are these some short, very quick things that I will read, but they're connected with the images. In the liquid depth of the abyss, a wild desire stirs giving birth to a creative frenzy and a limitless hunger for shapes that seem ridiculous in their uncanny aliveness under the furry forest canopy. I'm a red dot floating on the cosmic ocean of Tao, freezing and flowing with her ever renewing mood that paints a stark and a colorful scene, reflecting the still center of her hidden mysteries. Now this is something like Tagore's Gohono, Ushuma Kunjo Maje song, who whispers in the bamboo groves with an enchanting sound of flute music and beckons Radha and the gopis to abandon their duties, play holy and lose themselves in his darkling mystery. And the last one, I shape the scent of light with my power of joy that emerges from the depth of a sorrow so deep it can devour an entire cosmos and vomit it back into existence. Now, since everybody talked about what is going on uh, in Kolkata, I take the liberty of sharing a, a blog, which I'll just post on the chat, a No Country for Women. I hope that will change soon. Thank you so much. Thanks, Neela. Excellent presentation. And our tribute to Manasda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Neela. Uh, now we go on to Vinita Agarwal's poem, Anthem. The title of the poem is Anthem. Uh, welcome, Vinita Agarwal. I thank you to present your poem. Thank you so much. And I'm going to read out Anthem in the hope that we are actually proud of our nation, the way Tagore meant us to be when he wrote our national anthem. And we don't stoop so low that we have things to discuss like what, what just happened in Kolkata. This is titled Anthem. Every time we sing our national anthem, we feel a quiet storm of words, a bridge between the self and the universe, a voice of nature whispering through your pen. In the rustle of leaves, in the silence of stars, we find the essence of life, threads of love woven into a song. We dare to dream, to question, to nurture, our souls unbound by confines of time. In every heart, a flame ignited. Your legacy is a tapestry of thought. How this proud anthem emerges, how it echoes through the ages, how it stirs minds, stirs souls. Thank you so much. Thanks, Vinita. The poem, Madhu. Lovely poem, Vinita. Uh, Rochelle would be reciting her poem titled Displaced, which is an eco poem from her book. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Madhu. I'm just uh, going to fuse the book uh, launch in one minute and the poem actually I'm changing to a visual poem only 
to cut down on time so that we can all move faster. So this is my book, Coins and Rivers. It released in April of this month by uh, of this year by Hashit. And uh, yeah, thank you, thank you, Arindam. And it has all kinds of poems from uh, the personal to the political poems and uh, ecological, you know, environmental poems, poems on sexual desire and sexual violence. It has every kind of poem almost moving through the concentric circles of my own seeking and finding. I find that this is the same thing that happens in all my books, that I start with a very personal, the very private, social relationships, family, society, world, and even I have reached beyond the world, looking at the world through the gaze of an atom, as if I was first a woman in the city, then the citizen in the world and finally an atom in the galaxy and i think when we reach the stage an atomic stage we shed all our robes and signifiers of every kind race caste religion uh, gender and we become so neutral we become so so large and so small at the same time and so it becomes very philosophical to look at life outside of your body and outside of life. Uh, so I have done all of that. And uh, there are even poems that defy English because I have decided why should I be so respectful of the language and why don't I bastardize it and have fun with it and I uh, and have misspellings in that, which gives my editor trouble in accepting it and saying this is wrong. And I'm like, this is right. And so I have done all those kinds of things in Coins and Rivers. What I'm going to present is one of the visual poems uh, and I'm, I'm just going to show it to you from here I hope you can see uh, you can see uh, the page can you see the page so this poem is actually a gradient uh, it's I'm explaining the visual poem because uh, many of my readers just said, uh, we don't didn't understand this very well so this is the meat of India and since we are talking about violence the, I was talking about the goal and the women in his stories I thought why not uh, talk about this. Uh, the gradient shows uh, three uh, sets of middle fingering, middle fingering that the women are doing. The first middle fingering is, uh, uh, you can see it, right? I mean, a little bit. Yeah, the first middle fingering is a big one. It's on the x-axis. Uh, the x-axis has the, uh, the, <clears throat> uh, the men who are offenders in units. And uh, the middle fingering is very large. And on the y-axis, you have uh, the opportunities that the women will lose so what it means is that in a me too movement the women could only talk about the men who were offenders if she did not lose opportunities because she has earned these opportunities so with such difficulty that if she were to reveal every man who has troubled her she will not be in business at all she would have to go back to the four walls of the kitchen the next uh, finger is a slightly smaller middle fingering for the opportunities she will lose and the men she can expose. And the last one here is a tiny middle fingering because if she's losing every opportunity, she she is the one who has to think so many times because she's going to lose all that she's worked for, for one idiotic, uh, you know, assaulter. So this is uh, the poem that for me, I couldn't have put it in any better way because, uh, because in what better way can I put a poem sometimes, even the words fail me. And sometimes I thought the visual poem works. But otherwise, there are many poems in this book that uh, don't follow visuality, they follow imagery. And um, uh, I, I hope you do get uh, some time and space and mind to read the poems if you pick the book up. It's called Coins in Rivers. Thank you. Excellent book, Rochelle. I've read some of the poems Thank and you. I intend to read more. Thank you. Over to you, Madhu. Rochelle, fabulous graphic representation of your ideas and uh, representation of today's society. Thank you, keep shining. Uh, the last on the le list, not the least though, is Aarti Janki with her poem titled Gurudev. Aarti? Aarti, please unmute yourself. Arti, can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, yes, I can hear you. And, and, and the your video, video too. And your video. Yeah, the video. Yes, okay. Okay, we're ready. 
Okay, so it is titled Gurudev and it says, I found you first in my brother's voice where the mind is without fear, a morning prayer. I found me in life of my life the way I wanted to be. And purpose in give me strength I read every day. Strength never to disown the poor or bend my knees before insolent might. Strength to surrender my strength to thy will with love. I saw the Taj Mahal rising above the banks of the river, a solitary tear suspended on the cheek of time. I followed the voice of your pen, knowing that you belong to me as I have belonged to you in previous lives, the only guru I needed. Like the Gita to others, Gitanjali is to me an invaluable guide, a constant companion. Every word of yours seems written for me, the institution of writing, where I am a perpetual student. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. That was beautiful. So we had some power-packed poetry reading here. Uh, Dr. Anita Nahal's poem was so inspiring and you know, all the poems that we read here today had a kind of fierce power in them. Thank you so much. Now I request Arindam Da to come and offer the vote of thanks. Uh, before that, Rochelle, Rochelle, I would want Rochelle to... Rochelle has to launch the book. Then Rochelle, she has already launched have... the book. Oh, you Rochelle... have. Okay. Okay, just a minute. Uh, uh, does anyone uh, uh, want to ask any questions about the book or interact with Rochelle? We'll give you a few minutes. Anyone, it's an open house. Rochelle would like it also. So, you know, her book is uh, quite different from what we read. Her poems Thank are you. absolutely uh, wonderful. I've read some of these. And uh, over to you. Anyone wants to ask anything? Very quick questions, very small questions and very small answers. I just wanted to congratulate you, Rochelle. Uh, I, I, I like the uh, visualization of poetry. One of my previous books also had poem and the uh, vision, you know, the uh, it was not drawings, but they were pencil drawings of actual pictures that wow. I took and yeah. I matched with the poem. So I totally understand, you know, your vision and that once you see some, and I'm a visual learner. So when you explain your poem, you know, it really then brings it the whole idea to the mind. And hopefully, as, as I am sure you'll agree, that it will leave a deeper impact, you know, on people, you know, once they see it. So, yes. Thank you so much, Anita. Yes, I do agree that sometimes words, even words fail us writers and poets, and then you ha find a new way of saying it. So, thank you. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Congratulations. Thank you. I think uh, Amita Mitro, He's both an artist and a writer. And I recall when Tagore started painting at the age of 72, you know, he realized that he could speak much more through his paintings. Though those paintings were dark and gloomy to look at, you know, but he felt that, you know, paintings could say things much beyond words. So yes. Amitabh, would you please shed light and uh, your reflection on this with Rochelle? Unmute yourself, please. Unmute yourself. Amita, please unmute yourself. Ah, Thank, right. you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Arindam uh, uh, Poetry and visual art has actually gone together and I have actually fused it with medicine. So medicine, art and poetry has gone up to a situation where I am take, still taking it ahead. But I would like to congratulate <clears throat> all the poets here. And uh, I would like to especially thank uh, uh, Madhu Gangopadra uh, for that song, because it brought me back immediately uh, in the mind. My mother, she used to sing this song. She was a, uh, a, a Robindra Shongit exponent 
studied in Shantiniketan under the tutelage of the Gurudev. And uh, she had a uh, All India radio slot uh, thrice a week from the Lucknow radio station. So that song was uh, something she used to, uh, you know, hum when she was so at sorry home. Sorry to interrupt, uh, uh, Amitabh. Can you keep it to uh, Rochelle's thing? We are running out of time. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, I would like to also congratulate uh, Dr. Agarwal from Indore. Uh, she actually, we belong to the same Madhya Pradesh. I come from Gwalior. So anyway, I would like to uh, go more than that. Uh, uh, look at this one. Uh, this is the Chambal Ravines. And uh, it's a charcoal on paper. And there is a poem uh, which I have written. Here is a, a, a charcoal on paper with the Gwalior Fort. Very beautiful, so, very beautiful. Thank you, Amitabh. Can we have some will, questions, I please? Will just, uh, I will just, uh, you know, uh, because everyone spoke about the visual poem, because I have four visual poems, I'll just talk of another one, which is very uh, relevant currently because it's about women and men in society. I hope you can see this one. This went, uh, this went pretty viral uh, last week because I happened to post it and it, uh, it happened to resonate. I didn't even realize because I keep sharing poems and sometimes they don't resonate at that time. This one resonated. Uh, it, it's, an, it's a tilted Abraham Maslow's Needs Hierarchy Pyramid. And we can see that it is being, it is unhinged by some monkeys. So we see at the top here, there is this man who has transcended because this in the Abraham Maslow's Pyramid, uh, self-realization, self-actualization and transcendence is at the highest point. So we see the man who has transcended here. The women are somewhere down on the rung and they are, some of them are pregnant and there are these apes and uh, primitive apes who are looking at her body in a very lecherous way. It is viscerally disgusting and nauseating. And uh, you also see a hand here of violence and blood marks for all the sexual violence that happens in society. At the base of this pyramid, this tilted pyramid, you see three monkeys and you see ABC because they do not even understand the ABCs of life or living. So man is divided into the evolved man who's transcending and he's, he has his back to society because he has no time. Uh, these are all the CEOs of the world and all the presidents of the world who are men and who decide things and who are at the epics. And then you have the women in the middle because they have so many shackles pulling them down to the gravity that they never finish all their needs to reach transcendence, to reach self-actualization, to reach the room of their own. And then you have these monkeys and apes who are always surrounding them. And this is the misogynistic patriarchal society. So you have three different kinds of men. Because I feel when we speak about uh, men versus women, we need to understand that uh, not all men are, uh, so many men are supportive of women. So many, so many men are supportive of women. Uh, uh, you know, uh, they are anti-discriminatory. They they want to help out. Not everyone is against women. And at the same time, the people who are against women create the maximum shocking ripples. So I just uh, realized that this poem, which was visual, and it was called Gravity because we are unhinging from gravity, actually, uh, just happened to resonate this last week because of the brutalization of Dr. Devnath. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Rochelle. So we are coming to an end of this event, first day's event. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I'll now propose a vote of quick vote of thanks. I thank all the participants today. I'm not taking name. It will shut down any moment. All of you are here. And I also thank everybody who was present during this session, including Amitabh Mitro, uh, Prakash. I can see quite a few of them here. Uh, Urna, you know, uh, Smita, and uh, Atrey. I'm just randomly reading numbers, names. Please, please don't feel offended that I'm not taking other names. I've seen all, and I really thank all of you for being here. And uh, thank you once again. Thanks to uh, Madhu, 
And I need to thank uh, Anumita Chatterjee Roy, Anumita Roy, who has done all the visuals for us. And she's silently working from behind. You know, she's that, what do you say in Hindi, meal ka patthar, you know, the neev ka patthar or meal ka patthar, as you say, that you don't pay much attention to them, but they have an important role to play. Thank you, everyone. And uh, good night. Thank you. Good night and good morning here. Take care. Good Bye. morning and good night. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, Madam, Bye. for your great um, coordination. Thank you. Thank you. The song was absolutely fantastic. Madam. Thank you. Thank you, Dustin. Bye. Good night. It is shut any moment, so I'm closing it. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you, everybody.